kind of perfect. So yeah, I'll just get into it. I'm the facilitator today. So welcome everyone. Welcome to our webinar series. We've been on pause for quite some time, but then we are back at it again. Uh, today we are looking at applying photography to trace the slow violence of environmental disaster. And uh, the, the webinar of the seminar series will be handled by Alexandra and Emily, and here they'll be tracing a footprint of the slow violence as a result of environmental disaster, uh, following the unprecedented uh, floods that happened in KZN uh, in 2022. Uh, a bit about Emily uh, and Alexandra. Uh, Emily was the recipient of the Sir John Monash Scholarship, where she's pursuing her PhD. At the University of Amsterdam, her research explores the impact of the 2022 KwaZulu Natal floods on injuries across the physical, social, and environmental body. Emily is particularly interested in the in entanglement of people and then and their environment, and how is how does influence their health. Emily completed her master's in global development at at Griffith University in Brisbane, Australia. She has a professional background of 15 years emergency nursing experience, which includes disaster coordination and management, helicopter trauma retrievals, and most recently as a pre-hospital delegate for the International Committee of the Red Cross in Malaysia, Azerbaijan, Jordan, and Ukraine. Emily's interest in disaster management came from her experience of being a member of a health team that was activated to retrieve patients during a mass casualty event in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, From this, she was awarded a Winston Churchill Fellowship to study a Diploma of Humanitarian Assistance at Fordham University in New York. Um, and also Alex Alexandra Rose Holland. Uh, Alexandra has spent much of her last decade living in the Middle East, creating work that challenges traditional coverage of the region and its geopolitics. As the projects on climate migration, conflicts and post-conflicts evolve, her work has expanded into North Africa and Europe. Holland's background as an abstract painter uh, continues to impact her practice, leading to a multi-dimensional approach using imaginary found objects, collage, sound, and video. Her projects span years and often result in a vast archive that seeks to examine people and places from multiple perspectives, all of which challenge their accepted narrative. Holland's work challenges us to reimagine the stories we have already seen. Uh, Holland has shown internationally with both solo and group exhibition, including Leave and Let Us Go Solo, uh, from Amsterdam Road to Mosul Solo, and London Textures to Only Us Solo. Uh, Los Angeles uh, Photolux Festival, she did it in a group, and Tuscany, where I lay my head, and also that was in a group. Sydney, among others, Holland published her first work, book, Leave and Let Us Go with the Ghost Books in 2021, and regularly works with National Geographic, Le Monde, De Volska Grant, and Wall Street Journal, among others. Uh, Alexandra and Emily, welcome to the Center for Civil Society. We are excited uh, to have you, and it will be interesting uh, to learn more about the work that you've been doing, especially since you know the floods have impacted uh, many of us negatively, and also it happened in the province that the center is based at. Uh, so I'd like to welcome you. I'll be giving you around uh, 30 minutes to do your presentation. Then after we can then take uh, questions and answer. Great, right, thank you so much. Um, we'll just share our screen. Um, yeah, is that okay for everyone? It's perfect. Um, so today we're going to start off by discussing um, both who we are and why we ended up in KwaZulu-Natal and our interest in the flooding situation. Um, and then we want to go on and talk a little bit about um, 
both the methodology and the theoretical framework that my PhD is based on before Alexandra goes into more detail about how photography can be used as a medium to explain different levels and elucidate data that you might not normally see within the research process. Um, so I'm Alexandra Howland. I've been photographing for the last decade, primarily in uh, the Middle East and Europe. And now as my work shifts more into climate change, I'm working across Africa and continuing to work throughout Europe and the Middle East. Um, my work is sort of a mix between fine art and documentary. Um, and so I'll go a, a bit more into detail about that uh, later on. And um, this is me. I have a background, as was said in my bio, of um, clinical disaster management. Um, but my interest has really stemmed from this clinical perspective into disaster management, particularly environmental disasters, um, and then reaching on to this idea of overlapping catastrophes, which is what we've seen here in Durban over the last four years. So the approach that we're doing is a collaborative approach that works between this idea of research-based art, which is what Alexandra focuses on, and arts-based research, which is what I'm using. So we are um, two separate research programs that have come together with a common idea around um, this singular case study that is based on the idea of um, overlapping catastrophes intersecting with an environmental disaster being um, here in Durban. Um, my work focuses a lot around um, the idea of how art can be used as a medium to portray the lived experiences of um, the flooding event, but also to understand what those overlapping and layered um, trauma um, can happen across different aspects of both the physical body, the social body, which includes the sort of political and economic aspects, as well as the environmental body. Um, so as we know in Durban, over the last four years particularly, there's been a dramatic amount of issues that have occurred. You initially had the 2019 floods um, with this escalating associated environmental violence that is seen within every flood instance that occurs in Durban. <clears throat> then we went on and you had the very strict um, 2020 lockdowns, um, which were some of the strictest in the world and due to apartheid spatial um, inequalities created ongoing uh, social and economic situations that have been very difficult to recover from within um, Durban. Then you have the 2021 widespread political unrest, which has got an estimated number of 354 deaths. However, that's been highly contested within our research. Um, and then finally ending with the flooding event of 480 deaths. Um, so the research question that my PhD is primarily focusing on is this idea of how Durban has experienced injury and then where they're moving towards, towards a point of healing in this intersecting crisis that is overlapping and continues to happen with ongoing environmental disasters. So um, my work tries to understand how injury occurs and then where the space is that people can negotiate to move into a point of healing. Um, I end all of my interviews with this idea as well about what is the anthropological focus on the future of hope. So we use the golden thread throughout the research um, where we link um, this idea of following the floodwaters. Um, and the people that I've spoken to and been around have primarily been across three separate areas of which I describe as the preparedness the response and then the recovery using disaster management um, terminology. So we've spoken to people from the um, community-based early warning system through to Quarry Road West, which is the majority of our uh, ethnographic observation has occurred there of six months of observation. And then onto the response and recovery where we spent a significant amount of time with different responding NGOs, church groups, and then the search and rescue teams. 
The methodological framework for this um, research collaboration has gone into the six months of ethnography, um, then art space research and participation workshops, um, which has included um, some body mapping that we've just started last week, where we're mapping the lived experience of the floods across 10 participants using large pieces of canvas and different colors to represent different experiences and emotions that were elucidated from that um, situation of flooding. I then go on to do one-on-one -on -one life history calendar methods to sort of understand how people are in the position that they're in, so the standpoint that they come from, what is their background, what is their history, and how does that shape their ideals and their ability to respond and move into a space of healing post such a traumatic event. And then I finish everything with the Play-Doh sessions, which is where after I've done the one-on-one -on -one interviews, people have the opportunity to play with um, Play-Doh molding to make 3D abstract um, expressionism of their idea of what is the future and what is the hope around that. Um, these workshops stemmed out of my background as an emergency nurse, where I had the opportunity to do um, some first aid courses within Quarry Road, and it was a way to get the community to get to know me and me to know the community. And through that, we were then able to get Alexandra to do a series of workshops that were around photography. Um, I think she'll go into a bit more detail about that later. So that's the basis of our of our work. Um, I'm going to go into a bit of how um, how I've used photography in the past, um, so you sort of can understand my practice and how I approach um, a new sort of topic or issue. And um, so, starting in 2016, I was working and living in Iraq, covering the Mosul offensive, um, which was fighting against ISIS. Um, after about five years making the work, I uh, publish this book. Um, so the work is made up of three, three or four different sections. Um, the first is my own documentation from my time living there, covering both the conflict for the the first year I was there, and then um, the uh, like daily life and you know different sort of events that were happening throughout the next few years. Um, I then made an 88 kilometer panoramic image while sitting on top of, I made it through sitting on top of a, a truck and then we'd go down this main highway that connected Erbil, which is the last city to avoid capture by ISIS with uh, West Mosul where Baghdadi declared the caliphate. So this one image um, connects the entire, the entire road. Um, so I sat on top of a truck and then took a photo every three seconds sort of stitching this together and this image really plays with what our perception of conflict zones are, you know, how a photographer, a photographer is able to represent these um, different types of situations, the transition from normal life into conflict and, and what that means. Um, and then the next part of this work was collecting um, cell phone images from people across Iraq. So I started out um, not really thinking that this idea would would go anywhere because who would actually hand over their cell phone images? It's such a sort of private and intimate um, thing. But I started with a few soldiers that I'd been embedded with um, and just asked if I could take 10 or 20 of their, their photos that they'd already shared with me. Um, and once they said yes, um, I continued this project throughout, throughout Iraq. And so I now have nearly half a million image and video archive um, from over 55 different participants from across the country. Um, and so you have a lot of different images, you know, from soldiers, like you can see here, these are in the back, it's um, suspected ISIS members who are being questioned. And then in the front with the emojis, this um, soldier took this photo after capturing two suspected ISIS members in the back, and then he's placed over their faces um, you know, different emojis. And part of what was so interesting was being able, having gotten the entire archive, I can see, you know, the process that he was going into of, of you know, which emojis go on the face and, and what emotions does he want to be portraying um, on both himself and, and the uh, suspected ISIS members. Um, and then 
Yeah, this is again, again my work. So continuing to, to document both the conflict as well as daily life um, throughout the country. Um, I also had access to a few different ISIS members um, whose phones I also collected the images from. Uh, so this is two ISIS members standing on the on the Tigris. Um, again, cell phone images. Uh, and then in the back, you can see these are archival images. Um, so a big part of my work is collecting found uh, documents, and it it really enables me to build this wider context and a, a much deeper understanding of of the location that I'm working in. Um, to just photograph, you know, what you can see right in front of you and not take into account the history that's leading up to that moment leaves you with a huge gap. Um, so being able to collect these photos uh, sort of gave me the juxtaposition between say the photo on the right where the women are having to be very covered, they're having to place the emojis over their faces to, to give themselves anonymity um, compared with the photo in the back, which is in the same city but in the 70s where you know there was much more freedom of movement for women um, and you can obviously see from the clothes and the haircuts it's um, very 70s influenced. Um, so this brings me into the work in Durban. Um, I knew that I wanted to switch uh, to covering climate as it's such an important topic for us right now and I really think that there's a gap with how uh, media and the art world um, have figured out how to, you know, portray it and talk about it. Um, you know, we show these really extreme images of, you know, floods and fires, and we don't ever show, you know, the the lead up to it or what happens after. It's just as the main the main disaster point. Um, and to try and tie it to, you know, our day to day reality, I think is is one of the most important things that we can be doing right now. Um, so the, the first thing that I wanted to do, can shut the door. Um, the first thing that I wanted to do was, um, change the way that I'm actually using the camera. And so I've, I had one of my cameras, uh, converted. So part of the filter is taken out. And so it's letting through different layers of light. Um, and so this enables me to take images like this, which can show the actual health of the plants. And so you can see um, wherever it's red and orange, it's, it's showing how healthy the plant life is. Um, and so you can see this is the same image with a normal camera. Um, and then this is with the infrared camera. And so if I continue to use this, like in Durban, it's obviously very green here, pretty much everywhere. The, the health of the plants always presents as very strong. But as soon as you go to a place like the Eastern Cape or where there's you know, higher levels of drought, um, the, the colors that you get are drastically different. Uh, and then obviously we've been working in Quarry Road a lot. And um, this is the main sort of intersection between my work and Emily's. Um, and so I've been able to use this infrared camera within Quarry, which has been quite interesting. Uh, and then I'm also really trying to connect, um, you know, the the smaller, you know, the the smaller moments of how climate disaster is impacting different communities, and you know how we can build this larger narrative to really understand, you know, what is what are things that we can that we can do to change the situation? What are you know missions that are being put forth that are having an impact? Um, how do we sort of sort of change how we visually represent climate? Um, again, these are the infrared images on the left, and then uh, I do a lot of portraits within my work. Um, so the background on the right image is is meant to really create this connection between the infrared images as well as um, sort of reinforce this color narrative. Um, and then this is within Cori. Uh, this is one of our uh, researchers, Miss Ndisi's house on the left. Um, and then on the right, it's it's the alleyway. So it's sh showing this juxtaposition between, you know, creating, what does it mean to create a space as your home, to keep it clean, to, you know, present yourself and your your home life in, in a certain way. Um, and then how do you do that within such tight quarters like you're seeing on the right? 
there's also the whole other layers of, of you know, the, the things that you can't see with climate change. It's such a difficult, um, a difficult thing to photograph because it is so slow and it's happening, you know, everywhere and also nowhere. Um, so how do you try and portray that through an image? It's, um, it's something that I'm still trying to, to figure out really. Uh, religion is definitely a huge aspect of what we're religion and healing and um, of what we're trying to to show um because every different community really has a different approach and you know how, how do you access and explain something uh, like climate to these different communities so that's a, a huge part of the work um, and again this is one of the infrared images um so you can see the the difference in shading showing the difference in the health of the plants going up. Um, and yeah, these are our emails, so you can get in touch with us if there's any questions or anything like that. Well, thank you very much, Emily and Alessandra. I mean, it's, it, it is an uh, interesting piece of work that you have done, uh, and also com combining it with um, the academic side and then you should get the photographic side um it's it's, just, it's really quite interesting um i just wanted to know um if there's any questions from um from the team uh on the floor uh shona i see your hand is up Thanks so much, Andres. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Emily. Um, I'm, I'm sorry there's such a small group, but I, I do remember there being a smaller group um, once at a CCS seminar on um, rooibos, you know, the famous red tea that's grown in, in South Africa. And there were only three people at the seminar. And I thought, oh, my God, this seminar is bombed, but it was the best discussion ever. So mm -hmm. now I, I, I am sorry there's going to be like just a few of us in the discussion. But as I said, people will probably watch it on YouTube. But I um, so first of all, I just want to say, like, I find I find, for example, Emily, your background really fascinating and how you've managed to link the kind of practical things you did in, in that emergency work, that very practical hands-on, and how you've linked it now with your research and how you're understanding like healing or like coming back from, from a disaster, right? So I, I think that's, I, I can kind of sense your passion there, which I appreciate. Um, but I just, I, so I have, I have a couple of questions. The first is, um, something that I'm interested in in your in your work around um, documenting and 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 sort of finding those moments where you can see climate change has impact on people's lives. Um, the people that you, the people that are the subjects of your photographs. Do you think that the kind of work you do is helping them link? all those nuances around climate change to their lived experience and their socioeconomic status, for example, because I mean, I've talked to protesters who've said to me, oh, we don't care about climate change, we are probably not going to have a meal today, like, what are you talking about climate change? And so one of the big questions is, how do we link climate change, which really affects these vulnerable communities more, they are actually most impacted by climate change? How do we connect those messages with the narratives around access to socioeconomic rights, for example. So do you do you feel that that has been um, one of the achievements of, of you know, of, of your work and the, and the things you put together? Um, Alex, I was very moved by your, you know, some of those images that you sh you, you you showed us about your time in Iraq. Um, I, uh, then my other question was, I'm just going to go ahead and also ask my other question. Um, so the first question is, do you think that your work helps um, the people who are subjects of your work make the link, like link their socioeconomic conditions to all the things around climate change that may impact on them that they perhaps is not in their narratives or they haven't vocalized? You know, it's not something they'd be protesting about, for example. They would be protesting about, oh, we have no access to water um, or electricity. Then my second question has to do with how do you, I'm sure you have an ethical clearance process um, at your universities, which allows you to take photographs of people. But um, Alex, if you look at one of those images that you showed with the man, he seemed to be holding a baby. I don't know if um, you know which image I'm talking about. I don't know the baby's face seemed to be covered. So is the implication that the baby was harmed in some way or 
or was he just holding a baby? I, I just feel that that seems to me when I look at that, I see the vulnerability of that person, not just the baby, but the father, hold, I presume it's the father holding the baby. And I'm thinking that is probably the most vulnerable moment of his life and you are photographing it. So how do you, like as a photographer, how, how do you feel your photographs um, reflect you know, your sub, they, they kind of, what I'm trying to say is, I'm, and I'm not being very articulate, I'm sorry. What I'm trying to say is that your photographs reflect how you've interpreted a situation, but how can you be sure that you're interpreting, um, your photographs can reflect um, the, the subject in the photograph and how that person may look at the world or may look at that moment? Um, yeah, so those are my two questions. Um, thank you. And thank you for your presentation. It was really great. <laughs> And um, we'll answer the, the second question first. So that's a photo from uh, West Mosul. That's um, Rawa and her father. So Rawa was killed by a mortar that landed on her house. She was five years old when she was killed the night before her family was able to escape um, ISIS held territory. And I was working with the frontline medic group at that time um, beyond, the, beyond the front line. And we were, I was invited by the family to come down and, and photograph the funeral. Um, so it's always a, you know, a bit of a back and forth and, you know, reading the situation and getting that invitation and, you know, doing it in a very, very tactful way and also knowing when to stop. Um, so her, you know, the child's face was, her body was wrapped in, in a cloth that she was going to be buried in. So it wasn't done for, for anonymity. Um, but there's a, you know, there's a line within, especially conflict photography, you know, how, how gruesome is it? How, like how much like of the gore and of the conflict do you really need to show? Because, um, you know, everyone knows what's happened. We've all seen those photos before. So how do you show it in a different way? And, you know, is it really necessary to continue to show those images? Um, and so that's a constant conversation within, within this sort of field that I'm in. Um, and in terms of having the, um, the perspective of the people I'm photographing, you know, this is why I, I ended up working collaboratively with people from across Iraq to include their images in the work. You know, that was a very uh, important process for me because as a as an American coming in, I can never understand, you know, uh, an Iraqi's experience. I can photograph what I see, and you know, that's going to be a very important part of that story, but it's such a small sliver. Um, and so much of what photography has been in the past is showing just that that foreigner's perspective. Um, and I find it really important to be engaging with the communities that you're working with. So th like the whole process, as I was collecting the cell phone photos, it was collaborative. I've never published a photo without complete permission from the person photographed. It's a, you know, it's a constant back and forth. And it's, the question is how, how do they want to represent themselves and what are the moments that they choose? So the father that's holding a gun to his head that I showed that image, those are images that he chose, um, that he wanted to represent um, himself and his family and his experience in Iraq. Uh, so it, it's this constant you know, back and forth and, and trying to tell the wider story, trying to back up um, a bit further than, than what, photographers have done previously. Um, I might add on to that as well. Um, both Alexandra and I within our work have um, considered our positionality as major aspects. And as Alexandra was saying, everything that we've done is, is co-production. So I'm tied by quite strict ethical boundaries around what I can and can't show. So I obviously can't use the photos of the portraits. But in saying that when Alexandra does those portrait work, it's completely done with um, people that we've hired within Quarry Road who are helping 
um, you know, carry the equipment, move people around. Everyone has chosen to get their photo taken. Um, and this is after we've spent six months with them doing multiple workshops so that we can explain what we're doing, why we're doing it and how we're doing it. Um, so we have tried to take into account as much as possible our positionality, because I do think that alters um, the way power dynamics in general are always going to alter the way that the research um, data and the outcomes that come from that. But our way to try and mitigate that has simply been to, um, to do everything through this lens of co-production. Um, and it's worked really well. Um, the biggest issue I have with the ethical um, boundaries that I have to adhere by is that um, I work in this sort of co-production perspective, but then somebody has sat there and produced art and then I have to take their name off that piece of art because I'm I'm ethically bound to protect them. Um, and I do have a problem with that. And Alexandra and I have spoken about this at length because, you know, from a researcher perspective, I'm doing the right thing. But from an artist's perspective, she's like, you're effectively stealing somebody's art. And what does that mean for that person who has explained their experience of life through, you know, the art that they've made? Um, and I think it's a, I think it's something that uh, particularly as like anthropologists and sociologists, um, you know, who are working in these fields really need to start considering this. If co-production is something and a way that we want to move forward to try and reduce these extreme power imbalances that we already see within research. Um, just with your first question about um, um, with uh, regarding um, climate change and people's perception of climate change when the daily reality is urban survival. I think that particularly within Quarry Road, you know, they've had, they had a um, 2016 flood, the 2019 flood, 2022 flood, and then they had a flood only a few weeks ago. And from um, our experience of being here in January, February, March and April versus the last two months where we had, we went home for six weeks, um, the, the community looks completely different and there's like, you know, huge amounts of erosion. The um, toilet system has been even worsely um, destroyed from what it was a few months ago. So I think now people within that um, informal settlement realize that actually climate change is their daily urban survival. It's it's no longer something that goes after food and water. It's actually something that is part of their every day. Um, and it's in interestingly, the terminology is climate change that they use. Whilst, you know, I will speak to other groups that potentially have higher levels of education and they talk about um they'll talk about government uh, like necropolitical inaction and, and how this is the government's fault. Whilst, you know, climate change is, is very regularly spoken to me with, when I'm doing my observational studies within um, Quarry Road. Um, so I think it I think it is really interesting that um, they recognise that they're the most at risk. They recognise that it is climate change. And I think that um, particularly through some of our arts-based research. So um, the body mapping that I was explaining, um, the way that works is you have a large piece of um, canvas and somebody lies on that canvas and you draw around their body and their feet represent where, the, where they've come from. So, you know, their history and how they get to the point of positioning that they are now. Their head represents their future hopes um, desires and you know um, ideologies and life that they would like to lead and the middle part is the map so this is their their body and it's the map which is the story of um, the floods and we talk about color and what color represents and how color changes with emotion and it's so interesting when we have these conversations where people would discuss what are the colors of climate change because they see climate change now it's it's something that although it's been slow like a slow moving beast and it's you know this slow violent action it's now come to a stage where it is it is there every day and it's something that for them requires a level of um, forethought to to keep surviving it and to keep sort of this continuum of resilience
Thank you very much, Emily. I see we have uh, two other questions. Uh, one is um, on the methodology uh, where they are asking at one point, have at one point in your work used photo voice as a methodology? And also I saw a question that, what about the safety of the photographers in war zones? How do you protect your subjects as photographers, uh, as photographs? Could, be demanded for intelligence gathering and targeting. Do you want me to do the photo voice one? Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, so originally I was actually going to use photo voice. I think it's an amazing methodology. Um, and I think it's very interesting from a positionality perspective. Um, and then basically there was a few logistical issues around cameras and I was researching what cameras to use and poor Alexandra being the photographer was stuck doing lots of Amazon searches for me. Um, but then um, I sort of stumbled upon this idea around um, body mapping, but also using the Play-Doh. And for me, the Play-Doh gives a slightly greater sense of, of cre creative license um, because rather than sort of just shooting and po pointing and shooting, there's a sort of artistic capability of the individual participant to get involved, mold the um, Play-Doh and come up with something that they're imagining or dreaming about. Um, so when we did the Play-Doh sessions, I asked people to represent their sense of self um, and for me a lot of the discussions and a lot of the things that people did was actually what their sense of self meant internally so one of the quotes um, along these lines was she'd created a, a blue play-doh and then on her back there was all of these white sections and they represented the internal injuries that she had that she carries around um, on a daily basis from all the trauma that she's seen. And she said that she can't be one color because she's seen too much now and that has become part of her. And um, for me, that was such a profound um, representation of self. And it's something that potentially you wouldn't have been able to get through a photo voice methodology. So um, it was the new methods that um, I had created for our first aid workshop, but I found that it worked really well. Um, maybe the Yeah. Um, and then safety for the photographer in war zones and safety for your subjects. So all of my um, work is, it's always extremely well encrypted. Um, it's one of the, you know, the first things that I do whenever I'm making new work or working within these areas. Um, I've also trained multiple uh, online security courses um, for journalists. And so I'm, I'm quite good with understanding how to ensure protection for all of the people that I'm working for. Um, beyond that, though, I, as a, you know, as a journalist, I am covered within, you know, rights of privacy and, you know, I can't be, unless I'm like illegally hacked or something, um, I do have a right to, to protect my sources. Um, so it's never been, you know, it's never been an issue that I've had to, had to deal with. That being said, though, a lot of the images that I was given throughout the work in Iraq and um, by the cell phone from the cell phones, you know, they had, you know, human rights abuses on them. They had, you know, people getting tortured. Um, it, you know, they were very, very graphic and, um, you know, problematic images. And so it, it did become a question of, you know, what is my role as as a collector of this? And ultimately, for me, it was always with the, with the participant because they're the ones that entrusted me with this, um, and you know my my role and my relationship was with that particular person. Um, um, yeah, I might answer the last one because I actually find it incredibly interesting question. Um, so my theoretical um, framework. Um, I'm I'm using a mixture of two, but one of them is necropolitics, which. Um, potentially a lot of you are familiar with um, 
but it's this idea that certain um, beings of power will keep um, certain populations into a state of permanent injury. And it's um, this idea of social injury, social, political, environmental injury. Um, and I think that that's really what's happening here is it's not that it's a deliberate act of violence, it's a deliberate act of inaction. So you see within um, the South African government, there are all of these micro inactions that people do within the government that means that people are dramatically impacted on a daily basis. So living um, along the floodplains um, obviously makes that population incredibly vulnerable. Um, and the issue the, the issues sort of beyond the government to me, there are like a lot of other issues within there that I won't go into today. But I think that some of the um, aspects that the government should be doing to create um, a life that's, that's you know, nice to live in and that's at a standard that it should be in accordance with international law, which it's not at the moment, particularly around water and sanitation, I think has a lot to do with inaction. So um, for me, um, I don't know if it's the fact that the authorities don't care but I think it's the fact that they're not they're not producing any um, directed action to create change does, does that help answer that question I think they should they should be uh, covered but then also there's a comment that Cody wrote here having studied in Devon Westville during the dawn of democracy I wonder how it how the local authorities do not seem to care about the living conditions of people living along the flood plains also, yes. uh, yeah. I, I think I think I think that question was just answered. Yeah, sorry, that was what I was meaning. For for me, for me, that that last question is a lot to do with um, this idea that that the government the government doesn't put in efforts. Um, like they basically are in a state of inaction, so they're not doing any act like um, conceded act. They're they're situating themselves in. Um, complacency. And then uh, there's a comment that came through uh, directly and it's asking with this project, I mean, it's a good collaboration. Uh, what are the key aims uh, after completing this work? Uh, I think we, sh we should take that one uh, first. Yeah, so uh, for me, it's it's really trying to figure out how, you know, how photographers and artists can be documenting climate change in a more effective way um you know it's it's not through like i said at the start it's not through these major uh, fires and floods and these major extreme events like that's not really what we need to be paying attention to it's all of the build up to that and it's also based in resolution um and so how what is my role within you know visually understanding and translating uh what climate looks like right now um, and how can I change or help impact people's reactions to it? Um, would you like me to answer too? Yeah, so yeah. For, me, for, for me, a lot of it is to try and understand these spaces of um, future healing that can occur and how people negotiate this level of agency within climate change. Um, so, you know, Alexander and I are both looking at the same issue from different sides of the coin. Um, and I think it's been interesting for us to collaborate on, on the areas that we can, um, where, you know, obviously I've got ethical constraints and she's looking at it from a, a more visual perspective. So for us, it's been interesting to look at how we can work to, together to understand the situation from our positionality, especially considering we're looking at it from two, two different perspectives when we're talking about um, an issue that's well and truly beyond you know, two perspectives. So it's, it's so many layered issues that are associated with it. So it's that idea of putting two brains to one, to one problem and trying to understand and, and work through it. Thank you, that's perfect. And I think there's a question on the government that, I mean, you touched on the government that, you know, uh, uh, to an extent they are not doing enough, but then based on you being in uh, the quarry road and seeing, it, I mean, there are multiple problems there. I think it's shown to touch on some of them that there's poverty and all that. What do you think um, 
should be prioritized? Do you think in dealing with the situation in Quarry Road, uh, is climate change really what needs to be prioritized? We do understand that it exacerbates um, some of those issues. Uh, but then do you think at this point, is, is it something that needs to be prioritized? I think globally we're sitting at the tipping point. And so for me, you can't disentangle climate change from inequalities, from gender, from violence, um, you know, from poor health care, from lack of access to sanitation, because it it's it's part of it all. It's all part of the one story now. So as much as, you know, like for instance, you look at the toilets in Quarry Road. Um, and there's not enough toilets because the last lot of floods that went through washed away um, six of the, the community blocks. And so that that to me is all entangled. You know, if you don't look at climate change and you don't look at the hard rubbish issues, then um, and you're only looking at water and sanitation, then what's that going to mean for the next flood that comes through and washes out the, the newly appointed toilets? It's, it's all part of the one story. And um, as Alexandra said before, you don't know what the story is right now unless you look at where people have come from and where, you know, this, this sort of geographical space, this city and this country has been to understand a way that you can start to solve the problems that we're in right now. Uh, in terms of the photograph that we used, uh, which you know are really important, have you thought of communicating using the photographs to tell a story in terms of adaptations that can be applied uh, through like areas like Quarry Road? Because I mean, it, it is important that you know whilst we are addressing, we find ways that we adapt to them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, definitely showing. You know, I'm trying to figure out the the most effective ways of of photographing how things are being changed and what the resolutions are. Um, one of the like big struggles, for example, with the, the sanitation issues is, you know, as a photographer, I can't just photograph a, a broken toilet and then explain in the caption that it's a broken toilet because no one is gonna look at a photo of a toilet. Um, you have to find ways that are, are more visually interesting and engaging um, to translate these, these massive issues. Um, and like for another example, the, the, you know, different rewilding of areas that's, that's happening, you know, if, if you're photographing something like that, in reality, you're just photographing new trees that are being planted, which is, is just not an effective, um, image to show people. So it's, it's a very challenging project of how do you, how do you translate, you know, and and engage with these these topics and and mostly make other people interested um, and informed through them. Perfect. I don't know if there's any other questions from the floor. And with this project, have you guys collaborated with the municipality? Have you tried and shown the, uh, the municipality? I know that probably with you. Um, the findings are not uh, yet done in terms of your study, but then has it with the preliminary work that has been done, uh, have you tried communicating it to uh, the municipality? Um, I've had a preliminary discussion about creating a report based on the findings in the future. Um, so that's that's something that we would really like to be able to do because a lot of what we're aiming for is to give back to the community from the findings that we have as well. Um, and so that has been something that we've already started discussions around. And I think this is the last question. In terms of communicating uh, the work to the communities, have you what plans do you have in place to communicate? You know, the, the project that you've done outside the photographs, especially in terms of your research. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that we're we're trying to do is um, to create a sort of installation of the work. Um, Kathy is organizing and um, implementing a, a garden that's gonna be created. And so we're hoping to be able to present my images around that space. Um, so it'd be a community garden that Quarry Road, Road will have, you know, control over and be, you know, responsible for, and then to create that 
into a more beautiful space. Um, I'm hoping to, to show images from the Eastern Cape, which is a, a lot of where the residents from Quarry Road are coming. So it's sort of translating this idea of home um, to you know their city homes. And so that's definitely one aspect of it. Do you want to um, tell about printing off the photos as well? Because I don't think we said that. Oh, um, yeah, we, so I also did um, photography workshops, which was an important part of this process to sort of get people used to, to me being around and to understanding what I'm doing. Um, and so I was holding sort of portrait sessions and teaching people how, you know, how to take portraits of each other and of themselves and, you know, what, what the power of photography is and how you can really present, you know, the image that you want. Um, and then after these sessions, I printed out all of the images um, and handed them out to all of the participants. Um, and that was a really great, you know, experience because then as we were continuing to work throughout Quarry Road, you'd go into these people's homes and you'd see, you know, the, the certificate from Emily's first aid workshops, as well as the images that had been printed from the, the portrait sessions. And um, to give an idea about the number, it was just under 100 people that had the first aid course and it was close to 200 portraits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, and these are people who all of their photographs were washed away in the floods as well. So to sort of take that into account when we're talking about memories. Um, for my work, this is partially why I've worked a lot around um, the idea of co-production because I want to create knowledge between the two of us. So I have hired um, some research assistants um, with, as far as the dissemination goes, a lot of the work um, that I've done has been a direct result of, of these individuals, not only um, interviewing themselves. Um, so they'll interview in Isizulu and then we'll translate it and I'll just be sitting next to them. Um, but it's also around, um, you know, their idea of, of making an impact. So um, we've had one of the um, people that we work with has, has started this um, letter diary um, off his own back, by the way. That wasn't something that we asked him to do. And it was a way to explain, um, you know, his ideas, thoughts and feelings that were associated with um, the experience of, of living in Quarry Road and the experience of working with us. Um, so I think a lot of the way that I am working is intended to be um, as much knowledge of everyone else as it is myself, um, which once again, um, I'm bringing it back to the ethical dilemma that I have where I um, have to take their name off it. And, and you can sort of understand um, how unfair I feel that is um, around the ethics of the situation. No, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Emily and Alexandra. Uh, I mean, we don't see such collaborations uh, that, uh, quite often. So this has been a great collaboration and, and great insights in terms of the work that you you were doing. And I think one thing that I took there is that, you know, you even went into the community to have a workshop with them, uh, especially those that have lost their photographs. So that's that sentimental. Uh, impact as well. So thank you very much and thank you for coming to present at the center. Thank you for Thanks having so us. And thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you.